uh, land and transport in a climate emergency. Um, I'm Andy Milne from SURF. I'm the Chief Executive of SURF for those who haven't already met me. Um, first of all, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, among everything else, we are recording this conference session as we did last week's conference session and that will be going up on the SURF YouTube channel so you can see later on. So. I don't know if that means that people will want to moderate uh, their comments in terms of content or style, but that's completely up to you as long as you know that we are recording the session. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, SURF's role is in bringing together all the partners and processes uh, and policies and practice in regeneration across all of Scotland. Uh, SURF has got over 300 members from all parts of Scotland, all disciplines, all levels of activity, but we've also got a set of key partner delivery organisations and we're grateful for their support. You can see their logos up here and it's their core support that enables us to deliver these kind of events uh, free of charge. So we're very grateful to all of them and particularly to the Scottish Government for its broader support of SURF's work. Um, here's the Twitter hashtag, which I almost always miss out when we're doing live conferences, so um, please feel free to use that uh, uh, to communicate your unbridled enthusiasm about the quality of, de of debate this morning. And on that topic, let me just run through uh, what we're doing in these three sessions. Last week, we had a really excellent presentation from Catherine Trebek uh, of the uh, Wellbeing Economy Alliance and a discussion on that, the discussion focusing on how it may be possible, how it should be possible for us to have a successful and fairer Scottish economy while ensuring the sustainability of the climate and in general life on the planet. Now two of the key issues uh, connecting that in terms of place and connections or land and transport and that's the focus of today's session and I'm really delighted we've got Shona Glenn of the Scottish Land Commission and Heather Cowan of Transport Scotland providing us with set inputs here today uh, and they will participate in the subsequent discussion following some additional comment from Nick Skelton of, of Stantec who, who are economic geographers and assist in the practical delivery of policy into real regeneration projects. Uh, the third session next week uh, is with Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell and that is of course on present and prospective Scottish Government policy for ensuring uh, a fairer and more successful and sustainable Scotland going forward, both in the COVID context and in the climate emergency. So, uh, we'll then go on to uh, what happens next after that via my colleague uh, Emma Scott, who's going who's to take us through that. So, um, as I've said, uh, and as you might see from some of the names on the screen, SURF is a very broad church, um, so it's worth us uh, just checking out and knowing who we've actually got in the room today, because part of the process today will also be to make good use of your expertise and knowledge in helping us understand your views on particular questions we'll come to later on. So, but in the first place, a colleague Chris Lawrence here who helps us with all the IT stuff. Chris, we're going to have some questions to just help us sort out who's actually participating today. So, over to you for that, please. And you should be able to hear me now, fine. I'm fine. going to share on screen the questions. So you'll be able to see the questions there, but we're actually going to run this as a poll. Um, so we are, we've started the polling there. And, uh, end the polling, we're just going to relaunch, continue, right. That good, point. I can okay. see that, yes, good. So now good. you can answer the question. Just bear in mind, you need to scroll down the questions on the screen to answer as well. There's four of them there, which you can see on script. But if you answer in the polling bit, the polling section underneath the four questions. Great. Thanks for that, Chris. So as Chris says, uh, we, want, we just want to know where people are uh, and but also uh, what part of the country you're, you're coming from what sort of sector you're working with or volunteering with, 
And lastly, whether it looks like you think we looks like we're heading for a national lockdown beyond the problematic regional ones that we're dealing with at the moment. So um, we go through these questions. This also enables us then to break down the subsequent questions into who ge geographic perspectives on particular questions or sectoral perspe perspectives on particular issues that we're going to discuss later on in terms of land and transport. So, Chris, uh, my screen here says that we've got about 25 or 40 people voted so far. Yeah, it's yep. moving slowly. The, the, the faster people vote, the faster we can move on to the more exciting bits of the morning. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm not at all surprised to see, despite Boris Johnson's increasingly anxious urgings, that most of us, 96% of us, are still at home. Uh, we can perhaps have some discussion about the wisdom or otherwise of that later on. Uh, I'm looking now at the geographical spread as people are continuing to vote. Uh, looks like about nearly half from Glasgow, Lanarkshire and West of Scotland, nearly 10% Highlands and Islands, uh, similar North East, a bit more in Ayrshire and Fries and Galloway. And we've got um, delighted to have some colleagues from outside of Scotland. In terms of uh, people still voting coming in, but I'm looking at the different sectors now, about 10% academic, nearly 40% community group charity and social enterprise. I don't seem to have any housing associations in yet, which is a bit surprising. Some private, maybe 20% of fifth public sector and nearly 20% national agencies with 4% uh, others. So, Chris, I'm just going to look also at the expectations on lockdown. Gosh, that's pretty close. 50-50 on whether we're going to have an actual national lockdown or not. I do hope not, but um, there's nearly 30% people think that we will. Okay, still think... some more people to vote, if you don't mind doing that, because it helps us later on with the analysis. But I think I'm going to have to call that to a close there, Chris, if that's okay. Thank you. Yep, three, two, one, and uh, okay, so, I like the... so you can, people can have a quick look at the results there before we go on if they want and just see for themselves what's, what's what. So I think you're going to favour run down, Andy, anyway. Okay. Good. Okay, thank you for that. So now um, we're moving into the actual programme for the day, uh, and I've, there's a process that runs alongside all of SURF's work. All of SURF's work in gathering information, gathering views, understanding the reality of what's happening out there in different sectors, different places, different partnerships, is to help us understand how regeneration policy and practice can be improved. And on the policy side, SURF always does uh, a manifesto, produces a manifesto for regeneration in advance of the parliamentary election. So I'm now going to ask Chris to introduce a short film from my SURF colleague Derek Rankin, who leads in our policy work, to give you a little bit of information on that manifesto consultation process. So over to you, Chris, to introduce Derek's film. Hello, my name is Derek Rankin and I'm SURF's policy manager. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the development process behind our 2021 Manifesto for Community Regeneration and some emerging outcomes from the consultation activity that I've been working on with my colleague Christopher Murray. This is SURF's fourth Manifesto. We've produced uh, manifestos in advance of the 2007, 2011 and 2016 Scottish Parliament elections. Each manifesto is based on extensive consultation with cross-sector regeneration practitioners and is designed to produce a set of bold and practical policy recommendations across physical, social and economic regeneration. Each manifesto sets a foundation for SURF's policy influencing activities over the relevant term of the Scottish Parliament and informs our continuous programme of work. The objective is to constructively influence the policies, processes and investments of the Scottish Government local government and other relevant agencies. 
Surf manifestos set out the reality of the contemporary regeneration context and highlight what surf members want the Scottish Government to do differently in response to priority problems and opportunities. The 2021 manifesto consultation process has been organised into 13 themes covering various aspects of community regeneration. The consultation was originally intended to be based on 13 thematic workshops, but obviously we had to cancel these as a result of the pandemic. We have proceeded remotely by arranging semi-structured interviews with a wide range of surf contacts from different sectors who have particular experience and perspectives on each of our 13 themes. Interviews have been supported by briefing papers which set out the policy context for each topic and suggested questions for response. So far, we have completed interviews on poverty and inequality, inclusive growth, culture and heritage and the climate crisis. We're currently on transport and we're moving on to housing early next month. The manifesto process is ongoing, but we thought it would be useful to highlight some of the emerging outcomes so far. First of all, there are particular concerns about young people. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, many of our interviewees feel they've had higher exposure to poverty, unemployment and poorer mental health. Several interviewees expressed desire for policy responses like a guaranteed jobs programme or targeted apprenticeships or a, a Green New Deal specifically fo focused on jobs for young people. Secondly, a number of interviewees have felt that the pandemic has exposed a, a fragility in community development infrastructure and local government as a result of cuts over the last 10 years. National policy is very supportive of community empowerment, but many of our consultees feel that the rhetoric is not matched by what happens on the ground. They argue that now is the right time to restore that investment and to uh, rebuild that capacity with a new generation of community development officers who are passionate about reducing poverty and inequality and with the resources to work with community anchors on meaningful place-based change. Thirdly, there has also been a, a general scepticism about progress towards inclusive growth. Our interviewees so far have been unanimous about their desire for a more inclusive economy, but some believe that inclusive growth is vaguely defined and has in some cases become a meaningless reporting exercise. There is criticism of growth as a focus of policy and practice, as it may not align well with aspirations to respond more urgently to climate change and to improve the general well-being of the population. There is also concern over the lack of economic development capacity to realise aspirations at a local level. And uh, many of our interviews highlighted community wealth building as a potentially better model. Uh, there's a lot of interest in tracking progress on community wealth building pilot activity that's ongoing in different parts of Scotland. So please visit our website at the link shown on the screen if you'd like to find more about the 2021 manifesto process and we're very keen for people who, who would like to get involved uh, to contact Christopher by emailing christopher at surf.scot. Christopher is coordinating our interview schedule and we'd be pleased to involve other participants in the process. Thank you very much, I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Derek. Um, there was a. I'm just going to see if I can get my uh, get my video up again. Um, here I am. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much for that, Derek. There, there was a couple of glitches in that for me, and I noted some comments from others that got a wee bit of glitch in that. But I hope you got the main thrust of Derek's presentation. That will be part of the YouTube presentation that you'll see later on. Uh, basically, we are pressing on with our manifesto process, lots of broad consultation going on, but Derek is still very keen for you, if you've got an input that you want to make, to do that by emailing christopher at surf.scot, uh, or indeed, just straight to Derek or myself and we'll pass you on there. So, uh, I won't ask for any questions or clarifications on Derek's input there just now, we can take that later on after the rest of the presentations. So we're now going to move on to one of the main, two main presentations today on land and transport. And the first one I'm delighted to say is from Shona Glenn of the Scottish Land Commission. SURF has been doing a good deal of work with the Scottish Land Commission over the last couple of years in particular, and has been pleased to be part of the, an excellent piece of work which they are leading on, which is the, uh, the task force on vacant and derelict land. 
um, and the, the relationship between land and regeneration is clear uh, and there's a lot of very interesting uh, momentum behind changing government policy in this. So I'm going to now hand over to Chris, if you can set up uh, Shona's 10 minute film on her presentation on uh, land policy in the context of climate change and COVID. Uh, I think, yes, we should, we should be able to run that one now. I'm just trying to, oh, we've got a, we've got a hitch on Zoom. It's playing uh -huh. up, I'm afraid. We've just got, a, uh, I think I'm going to lose it just for a moment. Okay. Okay then, so um, here we are with the, the reality of uh, technology before us, so we'll see if we can get that up and running as soon as we can. Uh, is it more practical to move to Heather's input on transport, Chris? Andy, I think Chris has uh, had an issue with his Zooms uh, at the moment completely, so yeah. it just take him a couple of minutes to resolve that. Okay then, so um, are there any questions or, for us on the manifesto process that Derek outlined in that film? Anybody want to make any comments there? It's Heather, Andy. I don't know if you Heather. want me to come in and just say that, um, you know, I think there was some pertinent points there, um, you know, in, in the kind of the manifesto. I think, yeah. um, you know, the jobs for young people, I think it can certainly see that the, um, the, the, the impact that the pandemic has had on young people and jobs. I think um, you could extend the, the inequalities aspect through young people and, and look yeah. at, you know, how we can... Um, and the, the protected characteristics um, as well. So, you know, how do we make jobs for young people fair um, and, you know, reflect the society that, that we live in, in terms of, um, you know, the gender profile and ethnicity profile of, of jobs that are available for young people. That certainly resonated with me when you have that up on screen. Um, yep. Also, also um, the, you know, the debate about um, inclusive growth and, and, and growth needing to support um, again, that, that fairer society and, and also a green recovery. So you can't have growth in and of itself, but it, it needs to support our, our climate change outcomes and, and our wider um, you know, Scottish government aspirations around, around the purpose and the, the society good, that we uh, support. Uh, so Thank there you, might, be, might be other co people that could comment while you wait for. Sure. Well, um, maybe I would just like to add, though, that um, Derek alluded there, we served as a manifesto every parliament in front of every parliamentary election. The last one we did had nine bold and practical proposals. But for those of us who looked uh, at that manifesto, we also noted then back in 2016 that the two major issues around regeneration, land and transport, were so big at that time that we couldn't deal with them. And so that's, that's the, the reason that we've taken such a focus on land and transport uh, this time round. And it's been good that we've done so because in the period between 2016 and now, of course, there's been a great acceleration of interest in place-based regeneration. Now, SURF really supports that line, but the, the challenge with that kind of line is uh, how you then connect different places into a genuine network of exchange, of opportunities, of products and processes. And that's really for us where transport comes in and fits very well with the climate issue. Chris, are we anywhere nearer getting this uh, uh, presentation up? Yes, I think I had the same problem as other people in the Glasgow yeah. area, that we just lost connection. So that we should be right. ready to go now. So this is going to be Shona Glenn's presentation from the Scottish Land Commission. Yes, Chris? Yes, that's it. So if COVID has confirmed one thing, it's that our economic model just isn't working. It's created an exploitative and parasitical system in which obscene concentrations of wealth are seen as normal and people on the planet are treated like disposable commodities. But you know, if there's one good thing that's emerged from all of this, I think it's an enormous appetite for change. But I believe in order to deliver that change, we need to be putting land right back at the heart of our economic model. Now, 
I could easily spend 10 minutes railing about how unfair our current economic system is and how much damage it's done to the planet. But tempting though that is, I'm actually not going to do that because I don't actually think it gets us anywhere. The moral arguments for a fairer and more environmentally sustainable system have been made and actually they're overwhelming. But unfortunately, those arguments are too easily ignored by the people who've got their hands on the purse strings. So I think if we really want change, then we're going to start, need to start making our case in language that they understand. And to do that, I think we need to be focusing more on the economic case. And actually, the economic case is really strong. Unfairness, inequality, it's not just a moral issue. There's a really strong body of international research evidence that shows that inequality is directly linked to suboptimal economic outcomes. So there's lots of studies out there that show this, but one in particular uh, published by the OECD back in 2014, it looked at data for 19 different countries between 1985 and 2005. And it found that over that period, rising inequality had resulted in a cumulative loss of GDP of 8.5%. That's massive. And you know, the economic consequences of ecological damage are just as stark. Another study, this time published in 2015, found that unmitigated global warming could reduce average global income by 23% by 2100. So those numbers are they're of a magnitude that we just we just can't ignore. Even the most committed of economic liberals um, couldn't ignore numbers of those scale. If we want to fix our economy, we have to be focusing on both inequality and climate change. But what's the role of land in all of this? Well, firstly, land matters because land is a huge component of wealth and it's disparities in wealth that drive inequality. At the moment, the current net worth of the UK is about 10.2 trillion, and land is more than half of that. And that is just land, it's not the housing that sits on top of it. So if inequality harms growth, and land is a major component of inequality, then it stands to reason that if we want to get our economy moving again, then we have to look at how the benefits from land are distributed. Land, of course, it's also going to be vital for our fight against climate change. Um, in May 2019, the Scottish Government received advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change about what Scotland will need to do, about what we need to do to play our part in delivering against international climate change obligations. And in that advice, the Committee set an ambitious target for Scotland to achieve net zero emissions by 2045. That's fully five years ahead of the rest of the UK. And the reason for that, the reason why we've got a more ambitious target, is because of our land resource. We've got the capacity to do more and to do it more quickly than the rest of the UK. So if we want to rebuild our economy, then we're going to need to tackle both inequality and climate change. And to do that, we need to be putting land back on the agenda. So how do we do that? Well, broadly speaking, I think there are two ways we, we can be looking at this. We can try and change what we do with the land that we're already using by redistributing the wealth accrues to existing landowners and improving or trying to improve the ecological footprint of existing land use. Or we can be trying to improve the performance of land that currently isn't doing very much by creating new sources of value that we can use to support those who need it most and finding new ways of using land that, that make a positive environmental contribution. Now, I, I think in reality we're going to need to do both, we need a mixture. But for today, I'm going to focus on the second of those things. How can we make more of our, our land that we're not doing very much with at the moment? Because at the moment, let's face it, in Scotland, we're actually wasting quite a lot of our land resource. At the last count, there was about 11,000 hectares of officially registered vacant and derelict land in Scotland. And that's about 3,500 sites, and it covers an area about twice the size of Dundee. So again, it's huge. Um, and a lot of it's been in that condition for decades. It's just sitting there doing nothing. And remember that that only includes sites of more than 0 0.1 hectare. So it actually actually excludes an awful lot of the very small vacant derelict sites that we're probably used to seeing every day, you know, in our towns and city centres. Now these sites, they are quite literally a waste of space. They represent a massive waste of resources, both physical and human. And we just can't afford to continue to ignore um, uh, waste at that scale, particularly at the moment. Bringing these sites back into use, it really matters, and, and it matters for two reasons. Firstly, because of the harm it causes, but secondly, because of the missed opportunity it represents. There's really good evidence, and um, just thinking about the harm, there's really good evidence that living alongside or near to derelict spaces has a direct and harmful effect on health and wellbeing. There was some really interesting work done um, four or five years ago now 
um, by uh, Scottish academics looking at Scotland's excess mortality rate. And what that work found was that um, every year about 5,000 people more, uh, sorry, 5,000 more people die in Scotland every year than should be the case based on what you'd expect based on our socioeconomic profile. Now, one of the reasons for that is what the researchers called an adverse physical environment. And urban dereliction, of course, is a, a major part of that. If you think about it, actually, it's obvious why that would be the case. Because what you see when you get up in the morning, what you see when you go home at night affects everything. It affects how you feel about where you stay, how you feel about yourself, whether you've got the self-confidence and motivation to get up and go to work, whether you let your kids out to play, even whether you want to get up in the morning. So once again, the moral case here is really compelling. It's 5,000 lives we're talking about every single year. But there's also a powerful economic case. The cost of poor mental health to Scottish employers alone is estimated to be between three and nine billion a year. And that doesn't even begin to count the cost of the crime and antisocial behaviour that so often accompanies urban dereliction. But the other reason why it's really important we do something about this and do it now is because of the missed opportunity it represents. These sites could be so much more than what they are. We could be using them to build homes, affordable, safe places where people can live that create a low carbon footprint. We can be using them to grow food and create new allotment, allotments and city farms that could help us to address food poverty and reduce food wells at the same time. We could use them to create new parks and green spaces in, in our urban centres, providing places to play that we know are so vital for healthy child development and places to relax, which of course are vital for mental well-being, but also double as urban heat sinks and havens for biodiversity. We might even be able to use some of these sites to generate renewable energy, helping us to generate affordable power and reduce, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So all of that is fantastic stuff, but how, how do we do it? What do we do? What, what can you do? Well, as many of you will be aware, the Land Commission established a task force a couple of years back to tackle this issue. What we set out to do was to change the policy environment to make it easier for sites to be brought back into use for socially beneficial ways like this. Now, the task force is about to publish its final recommendations this month. And one of the things that we're going to be calling for is a major national programme of green infrastructure investment. What this would look like, it would be a targeted programme of investment focused on vacant and derelict land in Scotland's most deprived communities. And the focus on disadvantaged areas is really deliberate because we all know that climate action needs to be a collective endeavour, but unfortunately we don't all see it as a, as a priority. To many people, climate change is seen as a middle class concern. According to the Scot Scottish Household Survey, 75% of people living in Scotland's most affluent neighbourhoods see climate change as an ur urgent problem. But that falls to barely half of those living in the most deprived communities. Looking at the distribution of vacant and derelict land, the pattern is completely reversed. About 11% of people in Scotland's um, most affluent areas live within 500 metres of derelict site. But that increases to 55% in our most deprived neighbourhoods. So if we really want to make climate action a collective priority, that's where we need to start. So what we're going to be saying to government, or part of what we're going to be saying to government at the end of the month when we make the recommendations, we want government to commit major funding to bring it unloved places within our most deprived communities back into use in ways that are going to help simultaneously stimulate community renewal and tackle climate change. By doing that, it's not going to, only going to help us tackle deeply entrenched inequalities in, within society, but it can do it in a way that enables us to create jobs, create tra training opportunities where they're needed most. And it's going to help, it, it could do it in a way that will help us develop the skills that we're going to need to develop a green economy um, at, if Scot that, that we're going to need if Scotland's going to successfully transition to a low carbon economy. So we're going to be publishing the recommendations at the end of the month, and we would love it if you could help us to make this case. So anything you can do to help us amplify these messages and drive home the case for change through social media, your other networks, would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, thank you there, Shona. Great, uh, great presentation, very concise. I'm going to start my video again. Sorry, I keep forgetting to do that. Apologies.
So Shona makes a very strong case. Uh, the moral case has already been well made. Our focus now needs to be making the economic case for land reform. Talks about the three challenges of wasted space, impact on health and well-being, and the economic impact in terms of remedial cost and loss of opportunities. Uh, here, and uh, Shona finished by talking about the, the task force, which Suff has also been involved in, recommendations from that to come out very soon, looking for your support in emphasising the focus on deprived areas, challenging inequalities and increasing opportunities with connections to uh, a green approach to jobs and further economic growth. Uh, sorry, economic opportunities. Okay, great. We're going to move straight on though, uh, because that's about land. So what about how we get around between different bits of land and different bits of opportunity and building that fabric of social and economic exchange that needs to maintain uh, in the changed environment that we're all facing. So Chris, if you could now introduce a presentation, a very welcome presentation from Heather Cowan of Transport Scotland. Uh, then we'll get about 10 minutes of that and we'll then have the opportunity to begin to open things up. Over to you, Chris. Hi. Thanks to Andy Milne for inviting uh, me to contribute to the SAF conference with this presentation on transport investment and our approach in relation to climate change and taking account of the post-COVID economic and social wellbeing context. I'm Heather Cowan and I'm Head of Climate Strategy and Integration at Transport Scotland. The pace and scale of the collapse in economic and social activity as a result of managing the COVID-19 crisis is unprecedented and has had a significant impact on travel demand, in particular the use of public transport. The longer term effects of the pandemic on transport system in Scotland are still to be fully understood. Given the size and scale of the climate change challenge, this remains central to our work. Transport continues to be the biggest sectorial emitter in Scotland. Our legal targets remain the same following the COVID-19 pandemic. To reach net zero by 2045, to deliver targets of 75% by 2030 and 90 by 2040. I'll take you through more detail of our upcoming pieces of work that will support and progress our climate change objectives. Transport Scotland is currently undertaking weekly transport trends and public transport attitudinal survey to monitor the impacts of the pandemic and to inform the decisions that we take. For example, using recent data from the period 17 to 23rd of August, compared to the same period last year, we saw that walking journeys are down by 40%, Cycling, level, cycling levels are the same level compared to last year, but have been above 2019 levels for the majority of time since Scotland entered lockdown on 23rd of March. Demand for public transport continues to be significantly down compared to last year, down between 35 and 70 per cent. Car traffic also remains down, but by a much lesser extent, down 15 per cent, so much less than public transport. The future demand for transport is about people's and businesses new normal behaviour and choices after the pandemic in terms of work, education, accessing key services, leisure, visiting family, etc. And this will drive their decision about travel. There remains global uncertainty on whether temporary changes in travel demand will be sustained and whether behaviour will revert back to pre-pandemic conditions. Public attitudinal survey tells that concern about using public transport remains high and that more people are considering avoiding public transport and using car or other vehicle more than they were before when restrictions on transport are lifted. We published our national transport strategy in February this year. The strategy is a catalyst for change, setting a vision for Scotland's transport system over the next 20 years and is supported by four priority areas, reducing inequalities, takes climate action, helps deliver inclusive economic growth and improves our health and well-being. To aid recovery from the pandemic, our future transport system will still need to deliver all the priorities, priorities or bite in a new post-pandemic context. We are now working on developing our first delivery plan, which will set out actions being taken across Scottish Government to help us achieve our vision and outcomes. 
plan will be published by the end of this year. A key factor within our national transport strategy are that all future decisions in transport in Scotland will be made in line with the sustainable travel hierarchy and sustainable investment hierarchy. We will prioritise public and sustainable transport which have wider benefits including improving health and well-being as well as reducing emissions from cars and, and other forms of transport. The revised investment hierarchy provides the context for our investment decisions and emphasises the aim of reducing the need to travel unsustainably, investing in targeted new infrastructure only after considering how best to use or enhance our existing capacity. More cities are also adopting variations on the 20-minute neighbourhood concept, which is about living more locally, enabling people to meet most of their daily needs, such as work, education, leisure and travel, within 20 minutes from home. Safe walking, cycling and local transport op options, and therefore contributing to reducing demand for unsustainable transport. There is also potential for local hubs to play a part to enhance the choices available to work more locally and flexibly. We must all support, also support the delivery of our net zero targets through activity to decarbonise transport. We have set bold targets for decarbonisation of road, rail and aviation sectors, phasing out the need to purchase new petrol and diesel cars by 2032. As we transition to a low carbon economy, we must ensure that this is done in a way that is fair and in accordance with the just transition principles, enabling us to support environmentally and socially sustainable jobs. We ex are accelerating the provision of electric vehicle infrastructure incentives to enable the transition to low emission vehicles. If this includes over 30 million since 2011 to establish the Comprehensive Charge Based Scotland charging network, over 7.5 million strategic partnership with Scotland's electricity network companies, making good progress in encouraging EV uptake, with July sales figures for pure EVs increased by 94% compared with 2019. Through our industry advisory group, we're working with business to ensure that Scotland's transport sector can benefit from the transition to zero emission mobility. We published our rail service decarbonisation plan in July, setting our pathway to a net zero railway by 2035. We have committed to work to decarbonise scheduled flights within Scotland by 2040. Measures in the Transport Act 2019 support emission reduction in transport through encouraging modal shift, including an improved framework for bus services, low emission zones and the workplace parking levy. Bus services are key to supporting a transition to net zero. We have committed to bring forward transformational funding of more than half a billion pounds to create a new bus partnership fund for local authorities and to roll out infrastructure for the Trump Road network to prioritise buses in congested areas. We announced the Bus Priority Rapid Development Fund in July. It's for short term measures, but it represents an opportunity for local authorities to test interventions for bus as they develop plans for longer term investment in bus priority to lock in the benefits for bus. We have also announced 9 million Scottish ultra low emission bus schemes to help operators purchase ultra low emission and zero emission buses and over 9 million of funding for the retrofitting of midlife buses to become Euro 6 compliant and thus in line with low emission zone regulations for clean air. The active travel budget is over 100 million for 2020-2021. This will enable the continued delivery of high quality walking, cycling and wheeling infrastructure to encourage motion. We will continue to take action as we will have seen through our programme for government set out this week. And as we take forward our infrastructure investment plan and our second strategic transport projects review. The impacts of COVID-19 have a particular effect on our strategic transport projects review, both in terms of the base case and what the new normal will be, as well as potentially altering travel demand across the network. We need to take stock and understand this as part of progressing our strategic transport projects review. This has resulted in this work being done in 
a phased approach. Phase one will aim to report in spring 2020 and will focus recommendations which take account of COVID-19 context to lock in and transport terms the positive benefits and travel behaviours of individuals and provide a step change in investment which supports the priorities and outcomes of the national transport strategy. Phase two, this second phase will contain more detailed analysis and report in late 2021, take a more detailed holistic view and examine potential improvements to transport across the country in the round. As well as this, we'll be doing further stakeholder engagement from autumn this year using our regional working groups to inform our two phase approach. The climate change plan is currently being updated to respond to the new targets passed as part of the Climate Change Act 2019. These very ambitious targets include reducing emissions by 75% by 2030 and being net zero by 2045, as I mentioned before. The update was originally to be laid in Parliament in April 2020. However, this was delayed due to COVID-19. It is now planned to be laid by the end of this year. Although our emissions are being beginning to fall compared with 1990 levels, transport continues to be Scotland's biggest emitting sector and this plan will outline our activity to address this. As mentioned, COVID-19 had and is still having and will continue to have a significant impact on our society and on our transport system. Some changes may be more positive, for example, walking and cycling levels had been much higher in 2019 than 2019 levels. Additionally, the unprecedented move to home working could have significant potential in helping reduce emissions from commutes. In 2019, 4% of Scotland's workforce worked from home. A recent ONS survey reported 44% of Scotland working from home in April 2020. Transport Scotland in association with Climate Exchange have commissioned research into employer attitudes towards home working and how this may be taken forward. Our ministers have announced that our climate change plan update will now support a green recovery alongside other climate change policies. This means that all our policies are being revisited to understand how they contribute to green recovery to take account of the negative and positive changes of the COVID long term. We want to secure positive behaviour changes where possible while also ensuring that we continue to consider our just transition. This resonates with calls from stakeholders for government to act quickly in responding to the changes from lockdown. Some samples of these are shown on the screen. So in summary, our upcoming work is to take forward our programme for government commitments outlined this week, to develop and publish the National Transport Strategy Delivery Plan by the end of 2020, to lay the Climate Change Plan update in Parliament in December 2020 and support a green recovery and to take forward our two-phase approach to strategic transport projects review, setting out our future investment plan for transport. Our work continues following these into next year to deliver those plans and to take forward work on COP26 and to take forward the next full climate change plan. Climate change emergency remains our most significant economic and social challenge and we need to continue to respond and invest while taking account of the COVID-19 context. Thank you. Good. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Heather, that's a really full presentation there. As I say, very full presentation there from Heather. Thank you very much. Interesting on the firm changed hierarchical position towards sustainable transport investment Heather talked about, reference to local hubs and of course the 20 minute neighbourhood concept which was uh, prominent in the programme for government uh, announced by Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister the other day. Um, and within that, I thought one of the most interesting bits around this, which we discussed uh, when we were only concerned about the, the climate change, never mind COVID, was the question of a fair and just transition process. And I remember in a debate I was involved in, it was certainly noted that the last major transition in deindustrialization was neither fair 
or just on the most disadvantaged communities and has created some of the problems that we're all still dealing with now. So the fairness and just nature of that transition will be important. And Heather, towards the end there, talked about the impact of COVID on a much accelerated pattern of home working, which were most of us, as we saw earlier on, are all experiencing at the moment, and what the impacts of that will be on plans, activities and investments. So, uh, I was going to just uh, immediately ask Nick Skelton of Stantec to, uh, to come in here, but if, you, if you'll if you uh, indulge me, I think it would be better, Chris, if we just move now to uh, the questions, the, the polling questions, to get some input from uh, the audience that we have here on some key aspects uh, of land and transport and just to gather their views before I go to Nick to get his views on what Heather and Shona have said and indeed what we see from the, the responses to those questions there. So could you uh, put the first of those questions up for me please, Chris? That's a copy of all the questions that you'll be able to see and if we now run the polling uh, we will run this one. Okay. Um, that's come out. That's good. That's the manifesto questions for you there. Okay then, thank you Chris. So uh, the first one as you see here, which we're looking for your votes on, is your general view on the public policy response in Scotland to the climate emergency. So are you mostly, select one of these, pleased to see the agencies recognising the challenge and taking action? Or do you feel that actions and commitments don't go far enough? Or do you think actually there are more urgent policy priorities rather than the climate emergency? Or maybe you think it's just a bit too early to judge? So if we could begin voting on that, that would be great. I'm now just going to scroll down to the next question, which is on uh, the transport um, strategy main theme. So, Again, Heather outlined these four main priorities for Transport Scotland. But if you had to pick one, if you had to pick one out of those four that you thought was the most important, would it be climate change, or would it be health and well-being? Would it be inclusive economic growth, or would it be reducing inequalities? Interesting question there. Difficult choice to make, but we're asking you to pick your top of those four. So then, third question is thinking about the place you live and work in. What's the biggest local transfer? This is about where you live. So is it the loss of car parking spaces? Or is it the lack of safe walking and cycling? Or maybe it's the lack of transport overall and the poor connections of that transport. Maybe it's that the public transport is too expensive or just unreliable. Or maybe the real problem is that the poorly maintained and congested road network. Or, of course, there might be something else that you want to indicate beyond those points. And, or perhaps you don't really have any significant transport issues uh, where you live or work. OK, so that's the, uh, the third question. The fourth one, which people are already moving on to see, is on Shona's work around the Scottish Land Commission, although this question itself uh, is more of a kind of soft question on, because we've seen that there's been quite a lot of uh, government uh, uh, importance placed on community ownership and community enterprise. So the question from SURF is, in terms of better land use, which of the following do you think offers a more effective route to overall improved well-being uh, and prospects from disadvantaged communities. Should we really should we be focusing most on getting land into the hands of community groups or is it better to have uh, just more inclusive community involvement in land use and plans without uh, outright uh, ownership responsibilities? Fifth, uh, in terms of compulsory sale orders, uh, would you like to see uh, Compulsory sale orders for action on issues land. Uh, already a big group of people saying yes, nobody against it. But uh, interestingly, a bit we are trying to see some people unsure what uh, compulsory sale orders are all about. Land value tax, same issue. Would you like to see that introduced? Good support for that. But actually, uh, an equal number of people at the moment, Chris, uh, saying they're not quite clear how that would work. So that's interesting. And the last question. Uh, 
would you like to see legislation that forces large private landowners to downsize by donating land uh, to uh, uh, local community groups across Scotland? And there's very strong support of that, but again, about a third of people saying, well, I'm not quite sure how that would work. So thank you for your vote. I'm just going to scroll right back to the top, Chris, because uh, when I started this, not many people were voting at that point. So in terms of the public policy response so far to climate change, good support for it, but people wanting it to go a bit further. Uh, national transport strategy on those themes, climate change, edges ahead, there's a reasonably fair distribution, but edging ahead there, climate change at the top, uh, where people live and work, it's mostly, mostly lack of safe walking and cycle routes. Uh, land use, quite a, a split there between community, the focus on community ownership or just broader community involvement. Good, and compulsory sale order. So I think we've been through that. I hope that gives everybody an idea of uh, opinions shared with uh, this particular audience. So that information, uh, along with the detailed presentations you've had from Heather and Shona there, will be on the SURF website and principally via uh, a full recording of this uh, second session of the SURF conference on our YouTube channel. So now I want to open the discussion up uh, and I would like to do that first of all by um, introducing Nick Skelton who works for Stantec. Uh, uh, they are a uh, consultancy organisation in supporting the delivery of actual practical projects. So it's always useful to hear from you, Nick, uh, as a perspective on these policy aspirations that we talk so much about and we agonise about and we vote on. You get any views on uh, the applicability of that in the practical sense in terms of delivering regeneration work? Just to introduce this part of the conversation, Nick. Yeah, well, uh, I've, I've got some views. Um, I think there's there's obviously been a lot covered already today, whether it's Shona's um, introduction to the emphasis of the Scottish Land Commission and where the task force might be going. Yep. Um, I think there's a clear linkage in some ways with, there's an emphasis there obviously on disadvantaged communities and making um, the difference uh, most prominently when it comes to reusing, repurposing vacant and derelict land to the benefit of disadvantaged communities. There's clear links to the transport agenda there that Heather introduced. Um, and particularly, I think, in that, um, relative to the programme for government, the emphasis on bus travel. Um, yeah. Because uh, disadvantaged communities are disproportionately heavy users of bus transport as opposed to other modes. Um, I was also interested in, in Heather's comment about the dip in walking, actually, and that seemed to be quite extreme <laughs> um, year on year. I just wondered whether that had something to do with Storm Francis in terms of the drop in levels there and the comparison of weeks. Um, but either way, it points to the need to make sure that uh, disadvantaged communities are better connected to the places that they need to get access to. Both agendas, I think, also point to the um, increasing prominence of town centres. Yeah. Um, if we have a sustainable investment hierarchy for um, Transport Scotland's work, um, then that's that seems to me to be where that's got to be focused. And disadvantaged communities linking to that through active travel and other links, bus links, public transport links. Um, and I just wondered to what extent at the moment the thinking about um, shared spaces, for example, is is pointing towards centres. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the emphasis on centres, we're working on various projects at the moment and the, the COVID-19 um, impact, not not a response, or I suppose it's, it's a, a demand-led response, is going to see our town centres, um, if they were performing badly before, yeah. they are really performing badly now. Yeah. Um, so, so, can, can I just uh, interrupt you just briefly there, Nick? So, 
what we sometimes don't get enough of in this debate, as you and I have discussed before, is the perspective of the private sector investors and the private partners in, in regeneration. And uh, Shona pointed to that particularly, you know, like she says, the moral case has clearly been made. You wouldn't get much argument on that. But there's still a job to be done. And I, I would agree with that in terms of shifting uh, the or gaining the attention and the engagement of private sector partners uh, in this process because they've got uh, their own economic interests to be at the front of their consideration. How does what kind of issues do you have uh, in discussion with them on getting them on board this kind of work? Um, I, I don't think we have too much problem to be honest, um, right. because the, I think there's there's. It's not that their interests are radically different. They have an interest in margin, which is reasonable. I think in in the in the world that we live in, in the economic system that we work to, um, but they fully recognise that that margin is dependent on making sure that um, you know you have a the values of place that surf supports are reinforced, and they also add value to their investment. They also right. recognise that they need to respond in terms of climate change initiatives, in terms of meeting the demands of people moving forward, whether that's for better heated homes, whether that's for um, greener modes of travel, um, whatever it might be, I think the private sector is is reasonably sanguine about responding to that. It's not... It's you not don't, I don't, you don't think the, the, the present immediate pressures on, uh, just in terms of economic flow, that will bear on private sector organisations, that that will shift them to more short-term thinking, more short-term views rather than longer-term investment patterns? Um, well, it, it will do. I mean, the, the emphasis at the moment in the private sector, obviously, is, is survival, really, in most sectors. Um, even in the house, even in the house building sector at the moment, you saw the figures yesterday about values being at their highest level ever, levels ever. Um, well, if you just explore underneath that, at the moment you'll see quite high levels of nervousness about just how long that's going to last, yeah. um, particularly in the context of the potential for weakened demand as we move into the winter anyway, but also the challenges of leaving the EU. Um, that's, that will suppress demand in a, in, a, in a large number of sectors. The other thing, of course, is that um, what we haven't seen yet um, is what happens when all of the furlough uh, provisions come to an end and when um, businesses are forced to make people unemployed just because of the, the financial situation they find themselves in at the moment. It'll take some time for demand to recover on that, um, not just because the UK is feeling the pinch in that respect, but we're a major trading nation. Scotland's a disproportionate part of, our, of the UK's export profile. Um, we trade with other nations, all of whom are experiencing lower levels of demand at the moment as a result of the COVID crisis. So um, that will take some time to bounce back. Um, I think it's interesting planning for that. Um, so, I, you know, I was listening to what Heather had said about the resilience measures and there's, there's a reference to it within the uh, programme for government um, about how we plan for the next one, possibly. Um, I think it'd be interesting to learn the lessons of um, what happened this time in terms of a blanket lockdown for a period of three months or so, or two to three months before a gradual re-emergence and see whether there are things that we might be able to do safely um, during that period. Um, you know, there are some key things there relative to transport, for example. Um, there is key infrastructure which isn't being used because people are working from home or, or wherever. If you can if you can actually carry out repairs to that, deliver that in that interregnum, if you like, then we might be able to take advantage of it as long as we can do it safely. I, I think the whole resilience question is quite interesting. Hopefully we won't have a COVID-23 or COVID-30 or whatever it might be. But it'd be useful to learn the lessons of the lockdown process and see whether there there might be opportunities there. I know that sounds no, no, I, I agree. I mean, there, there, there are clear opportunities there. And, and, and the question is whether we 
as you say, whether we can learn from the experience. We're not always very good at that, I don't think, uh, and whether we can find our way to take the opportunities as they're there. We, there's been a long line of discussion about how much it would be better if we were dealing with more local economies, more inclusive economies, shorter supply lines, and to some degree that's being forced on us by, by this process now. So, thank you very much for that, uh, Nick. I'm now going to uh, just open the discussion up. Uh, any questions? If you just indicate, uh, I'll look to my colleague uh, Emma Scott to help me spot who's wanting to come in with any comments or questions on anything that you've heard so far, either from the uh, the film presentations or what Nick was saying there. So, over to anybody. Andy, we've had a few comments in yep. from um, Jamie Baker at East Lothian and Stuart Hay at Living Streets, if you would like me to bring any of them in. Please do that. On you go, Emma. Yep. Just do that just now. Jamie, I'll bring you in first. I'll just, uh, if I can get you to unmute your camera and sound, please. Yep, there we've got Jamie now. Just need your sound now, Jamie. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do this on my phone because um, we're not allowed to zoom from the council. Um, no, I, mean, I was I was just commenting on the um, oh, on the on the, the question from the the poll in, ter in terms of um, uh, transport and travel, and I think I think that we we we, we focus on the, the the measures that we would like to see, but the thing that we keep coming back against is is behavior of users and the right. fact that we, we 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 love our cars um everyone everyone does um and 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 the argument is always well you can you can have as many cycle paths and as many um uh, lovely places to walk as you like but as soon as people are hurried or it's raining then they're they're just not going to use it um <clears throat> And I mean, I think that some of that is 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 just down to the the, the speed that we we live at now, um, yeah. and the, the the amount of movement that we feel that we need to uh, we need to engage in. Um, so again, part 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 of this may be addressed by a, a slight change of a change of life speed um, and expectations around people's commute and things. Um, but until we until we really address some of the underlying issues, then just putting measures in. Um, is 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 you know it's, it's icing an uncooked cake in effect. Um, you're you're not you're not there yet at that point. No, I think I think good points. I, I think it's always important that uh, ordinary folk such as they exist uh, see the the benefits and the practicality for them. You want to come back on that at all, Heather? Um, I'm happy to come in, and I, I agree with the the statement. I mean the. You know, reducing emissions um, from transport. Transport is the biggest emitting sector. We know that um, car is the biggest contributor to that. Um, I'm particularly concerned about single occupancy car. Um, and so the, there is a role for um, disincentivizing car use and encouraging that um, behavior change. I mean, in, in terms of delivering our climate change targets, it's about a million you know, more than a million individual decisions that we all make about how we live our lives, about, um, you know, how we under, undertake um, undertake the, you know, the wide variety of our lives that, that drive the demand for transport. And, and I think it relates also to the to the business discussion earlier uh -huh. um, in terms of, um, it's also in, in terms of emissions, especially if you look across, um, you know, the rest of uh, loads, it's also about those decisions that, that businesses um, take. And I think that, that COVID will have an impact. I think we've started to, to see the potential for that around, you know, the supply chain for EVs and things like that. Um, so yes, there's, there's definitely a role um, for disincentivizing car use uh, and and helping that behaviour change shift. I suppose, um, I suppose on the, on demand the, management mode shift, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, Jamie, when, when people are making that consideration as to whether they want to, you know, shift a bike or whatever, it's important that the opportunity is there and it feels safe. I mean, my understanding is that one of the main barriers to people using bikes more is they just they still don't feel roads are, are safe enough for them or, or for their kids. So some you have to I suppose you have to do some advance investment to make sure the, the infrastructure is there for people to use. Bit of a risk though I do appreciate and a, and, a, and a task in terms of convincing politicians and other colleagues to go with that. You've got Stuart Hay from Sustrans has got his hands up as well so I'm good, sure when good, he good. comes in that he'll comment. 
Emma. Andy, I'm going to bring in Stuart Hay and then Stephen from Strathleave and Regeneration and then David Hume. So if Great. Stuart could uh, unmute and put his camera on, please. Yep. Hi, Stuart. Okay, hello, everybody. That was hello. fantastic presentations this morning. I, I'm going to try and join up a couple of things with between land reform and transport. Um, for some reason, you can't see me. But, um, um, okay. Pile on, pile on. Um, so um, the, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a definite link there, and I think one of the problems we have at the moment is we can't afford a lot of infrastructure that developers should be providing because they've paid too much for the land, basically. So they've, they've not priced in all the infrastructure that communities need. So we need to tackle that. And I think it's even worse than that, that when the, pri when the public sector does provide this type of infrastructure, that value is transferred into the private sector. Uh, so we don't see any value for that. So I think all this stuff is affordable, but not affordable within the economic model. And I don't think we're really having that debate at the moment. We know what needs to be done. We just need to work out to pay for it. And the logical place to look at that is in the land. So I'll stop there. Very good. Thank you. And thanks for being concise there. That's always helpful, Stuart. Shona, do you want to come back on that at all before I go over to Stephen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just checking to make sure my mic wasn't muted. Yeah, yeah, I will. Because um, I, I think I think you raised an important point. And I, I'd agree with you. I, I think um, in, insofar as absolutely the, the current model that we're using to deliver development, um, it doesn't allow the public uh, the, the public um, to capture, I, I think, the uplifts in, in land value that accrue from, from development. I think we do, I spotted a, a question there, maybe come on to it, um, about development land taxes. I, I do think we need to be careful, though, because the UK has got a long history in um, development land taxes, and it's not been a very successful history. There's been at least four attempts um, since the 70s to introduce development land taxes, and none of them have succeeded. Um, they've all ended up being repealed and one of the main reasons for that is because actually w when these taxes have been introduced before all that's happened is that landowners have just stopped releasing land and that's, that's clearly not going to be in anybody's interests. So um, I, I think to sum up our position actually I think where we've got to is actually it's much much better if we can be promoting a, a model of development that, that relies much more on um, cooperation and collaboration between the public and private sectors, rather than the public sector sort of trying to force the, the private sector to do things, because that, that way it, it just doesn't it doesn't seem to work. Okay, that's that interesting, Sean. And I mean that balance between pressure, the threat of legislation actually, uh, and encouraging people. And we, we talked about this in the development of uh, compulsory sale orders as. A tool of encouragement rather than a rather than a piece of action in themselves, perhaps. Um, Emma, can we bring Stephen in now, please? Yep, yep. He's, getting, he's just uh, starting up his video. Good. Okay. Sorry, Andy. While while uh, Stephen's doing that, can I make a quick comment on do, on do, something do. that Stuart said? Um, it's quite interesting because the um, the land value capture is um, is critical to this. So um, there's there's a difference in approach when you're looking at, at the the economic benefit of major infrastructure at the moment in Scotland relative to the UK or England. Um, in England, they're actually applying um, land value uplift as the kind of main good from major infrastructure improvements. Um, and that's introducing some tensions in the system. It captures the land value uplift. So if we invest right. in, in infrastructure in this to service a piece of land, what's the land value uplift? Um, you're bang on, Stuart, that the value goes to the, the private developer. But when we were looking at housing infrastructure fund bids down south, um, the communities and local government department down there came in and when when they were actually scrutinising some bids said, well, aren't we just putting money in the pockets of the private sector here disproportionately? What are your proposals for clawing it back and making sure this infrastructure pays for itself? So there are beginnings, there's the beginnings of change certainly um, down south. Um, up here we don't have the same assessment model yet, but there might be some kind of hybrid, Stuart, that actually starts moving towards that. Okay, thanks. Maybe that Shona wants to come back on that later, but let's get Stephen in and you, your point, Stephen. Over to you. Yes, Andy. My, my point, uh, I've been working in regeneration for many, many, many years on all different sorts of locally based economic activities. And 
it, it's become very clear to me the longer I've been in the profession, land ownership is such a fundamental influencer in locally controlled economic development. Uh, and, and I would even now say far and away more important than anything else. Uh, and if there's a way that either asset transfer or the gift of land or uh, a, a, even some other form of, of, of inheritance of land can be shoehorned into community control, you've got all the ingredients of the sorts of things that we've been struggling with for years. Community empowerment, community ownership, community pride and ability to create action rather than watch others uh, undertake work on our collective behalf. You've also got the opportunity through joint ventures uh, and with land that other people might want to buy from you or rent from you, you've got the opportunity to influence what goes on on the land that you want. And in Strathclyde Urban Regeneration, we have a very easy time, man. We've got 30 or so acres left. And if we don't like the story that comes to us from a private sector developer, we don't let them have our land. So we control the profit margins. We control what they're going to do on our land. We control the, the, the supply chain activities, the local apprenticeship schemes, and all the things that, that, that died in the wool regeneration people like myself and my company and my board are, are, are up to. You can just flow them into a contractual relationship with any end user and say, if you don't want to sign these things, don't. And go and find a site somewhere else. Okay. I think that's such a powerful point. It, it is a powerful point, and, uh, and but hangs the question of the uh, ability to effect the land transfer to the community in the first place, it, 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 uh, which, which we may come back to. So thank you for that. And so let's move on uh, just and bring David Hume in, Emma. Uh, David Hume. Yeah. Um, could you switch on your camera and sound, please? Okay. David's kind of muted again. Yeah. Just oh. Oh, yep, yep, David, you're on. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks for both the presentations and the discussion. Uh, fascinating. Uh, my uh, question was about the um, was about land values and in particular development land tax. And I think the comments that have been made have been have been very interesting. So let me flex my question a wee bit. And, and ask, well, a reply to, to Shona that uh, uh, with regard to her comments about the development land taxes which have been in place previously, I think it's not, it, it's not an irrelevant fact that um, in the repeals that she was talking about, uh, that was the repeal of legislation by a government of one particular stripe um, that was different to the government that introduced the legislation. So it's perhaps not surprising that the community land tax was repealed by the Conservative, uh, the subsequent Conservative government. Anyway, um, with regard to her comments that she's just made about the development land tax, I, I think it's interesting that in around about 2018, the Scottish Land Commission, that within the Scottish Land Commission publications, there was a flurry of activity around land value taxes and so on. Yeah, yeah. And I just wonder, and, and I've not seen very much recently, so I just wondered whether the line that Shona gave us in response to previous questions is indicative of the Scottish Land Commission, Commission, Commission having taken a definitive position on development land taxes in, in the sense that that's not an issue that it will be revisiting again, or okay. Is there some hope that the Scottish Land Commission might turn again to the whole issue of uh, development land taxes and the role that, that they can play in regeneration? Great. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, and it's, it's good that David, rather than me, brings in that reality that we all know is there but don't often talk about, which is politics and the way in which political perspectives uh, affect the kinds of decisions that are made and the kind of investment directions that are taken. But on that particular point that David asks Shona about, does the Scottish Land Commission have or has it arrived towards a settled view on land value tax and the merits thereof or the practicality thereof? So there's, Andy, there's, there's actually quite a lot of different issues um, tied right. 
that question, so I'll, I'll do my best to try and try and address them. And um, on the issue of, of tax, and um, not 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 land value tax, but tax generally. And um, yes, absolutely, we um, are going to be doing um, so some more work on that this, um, this year and, and into next year. And um, that, but I think I think it's important when we're to, when we're talking about land value tax. Actually, people tend to talk about land value tax and indeed development land tax as if it's a, a well defined thing you know it, it, it's a it's a proposal and it actually it isn't and um, there's an awful lot of different ways that you you could tax the the value that, that accrues in land and um, and it's important I, I think it's important that we don't oversimplify the argument so yes absolutely we are intending to do some further work on tax this year and into next year and that will include um, various taxes or, and various ways that you could use the tax system to tax and um, uplifts and land values and um, on this specific issue of how you or how the public sector, uh, the public rather, can capture more of the value from um, uplifts in development land, and I, I actually think I, I think what's really important here is that we try and move away from this kind of almost head-to-head -head struggle we've been seeing and um, over, over well decades, frankly, and um, it, it's just not a healthy place for um, to be for the public sector and the private sector to be constantly um, fighting each other on this. And um, I think we need to find a way where actually the public sector can harness the, the sort of rational self-interest of the private sector and make it within their interests to to deliver um, projects and outcomes that are within the public interest. And that that's more than possible. Um, I think, but I think the way that we, we need to do that is by the public sector taking a much more proactive approach to development um, what, what we've described in the past as public interest led development where the public sector um, takes a role in really uh, you know coming up with the ideas, initiating development, leading development and actually taking, some of, taking on some of that risk because if the public sector takes on some of that risk and um, that then allows the private sector to be able to take a, a lower profit and it allows that value to be shared more. So I think really, instead of talking about land value capture, we need to be talking about land value sharing. I think that's going to be much more effective. Yeah, I, I suppose capture is quite a pejorative term now that you say that, yeah, land value sharing. Um, okay, Emma, there was another couple of questions. Yeah, so I had uh, some comments from Marion McDonald and Barbara Kerr. So if I could ask Marion to come in first, please, and uh, unmute. And switch your camera on. Mary. Marion. We've only got a few minutes left on this before we begin to wrap up. So are these are the last two seconds. Marion's here, Andy. Had to chat. Sorry? Marion's business name. Marion. Hello, Marion. Yeah. Hi there, yeah, yeah, it was just another connection between land ownership and transport. I'm out in the, the Highlands and I've been involved before in trying to um, create cycling uh, infrastructure between communities. Sometimes it's a very short distance, it's very cycle commutable, but just a very dangerous, you know, six mile an hour stretch of road. And it is a, it's difficult to convince landowners to part with just that two metre strip at the edge. They may own the land from you know, <laughs> move forward to Gearlock in one example, um, but you're getting to part with that little one and a half metre strip can, can prove um, just a real barrier. Um, and it's not, as far as I know, certainly in Highland, it's never been attempted to do any kind of compulsory um, purchase, but uh, any kind of, you know, tiny, if you could get a tiny portion of the land uh, for, for cycle infrastructure, that would really help in a, in a rural context, I think. Good. Okay, a point well made. And so it, the practicalities of this are really still quite problematic in relation to the the ownership of issues in terms of private and and, and broader public benefit. Another point then coming in that maybe the last one we're going to yeah, take. Yeah, that was uh, Barbara Kerr. Barbara, if you could unmute and thank you. Yeah. Hi, Barbara. Um, sorry, my window's open and there's traffic going by, so apologies. That's all right. There's noise. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure if I would be speaking. Um, but yeah, no, just very quickly, um, uh, along with the sort of safety of infrastructure and the availability of infrastructure that's already been mentioned, if you're looking at um, people doing longer journeys actively or sustainably, then actually making um, bike space on trains or even on buses available um, is a really important part of that process. Because if you um, want to cycle, you know, up to three to five miles to your nearest train station or or convenient mm. bus stop, and then at the other end you also want to cycle another up to three to five miles to work. Um, taking the bike on that public transport in the middle, at the moment, is really problematic, especially in more rural areas. 
um, where rail and bus services are much more limited. Um, and also having an integrated ticket option for um, public transport forms and cycle hire schemes um, would really help with that as well. So, you know, you could cycle your own bike to your local train station, leave it there, get on the train and then use the cycle hire scheme yeah, yeah. yeah. to your final destination. Um, yeah. And at the moment that just doesn't really exist. So it's just to kind of... No, that. No. Okay, so I think two good points in there. One, one that's frequently struck me when I come back from abroad and sometimes not from very wealthy countries is one way or another, no criticism of Transport Scotland at the moment, we don't quite have that kind of interconnected either ticketing or physical connection systems in transport yet. Heather, you, would you want to make any comment on that particular point? Uh, yeah, happy to come back in and um, agree with the comments made. Um, we do have our, our commitments around smart and integrated, so we do now have the ability to have one smart card and for that to work across modes. But I think also relevant here is thinking about um, mobility as a service and what that might be able to bring us in terms of um, in terms of integrated journeys, different payments aspects of the use to kind of drive data. We have got a two million mobility as a service fund and um, three uh, projects awarded um, to build the evidence base about um, mobility as a service because I think this is this is where we want to get to. But yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's it's. You know, the, there's complexity and reasons why we haven't got there, you know, thus far um, today. If, if, if it had been easy, it, it, it would have been done in terms of, <laughs> in, in terms right. of the, um, you know, the benefits um, that, that, it would, that it, it would bring. Um, so, so, yes, um, agree with the comments. Um, we, we are um, committed to smart and integrated through our smart um, programme and we're, we're looking um, to develop the evidence on mobility as a service to see how we can integrate. Um, across modes to encourage active travel, disincentivise car and, um, and contribute to uh, reduced emissions. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. And so, I mean, again, as, as I think Nick referred to there uh, earlier, uh, the present challenges, the added challenges of COVID on top of our considerations of the very urgent climate emergency is going to make us, means we're going to have to find some solutions in shorter term. So maybe there are some opportunities and some benefits in there. Okay, I'm going to try and just pull this together now by saying um, thank you particularly to, to Shona Glenn, to Heather Cowan, and also to Nick Skelton for making those inputs and for everybody else participating. And to remind you, this was the second session of uh, the SURF Conference 2020. The first one having focused on climate change, this one on land and transport as key issues. And the next session, I mean, we've talked a lot today about policy, about where policy is going, what the policy priorities need to be. So the final session next week, a week today, will be, I'm pleased to say, with uh, Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell presenting where we're at at the moment with Scottish Government policy, how that's shifting, and there'll be the similar kind of opportunities you've had today to add your, your views, your comments, your influence uh, towards further informing and improving that policy. So I hope there'll be uh, good support for that. Uh, again, uh, the presentations you've seen today will be put up on the, on the SURF website. Uh, you can already see last week's session there. And by the end of it, we'll have a sort of Netflix mini series of uh, surf conference events uh, on, on YouTube. I'm going to, uh, though, just remind you that surf is involved in lots of other work uh, alongside this. Uh, and so I'm going to pass over to you, Emma, to tell us just a little bit about some other opportunities there are for more involvement in surf's work. Yeah. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen again. Last week, this was a disaster, but um, we will see if it will work this week. Well, that's right, I'd forgotten that. It didn't work, <laughs> did it? Maybe you'll just have to talk through it again. I know. Improv. Does <laughs> uh, yep. everyone can see that? Uh, it's coming up, I think. Yep. Really okay, yet. so <laughs> first it's just a wee bit about SURF membership. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of our members on today, but if you're not a member of SURF, um, it's £50 for an organisation and £20 for community groups and individuals. Um, it, early access to all our conferences, some of which uh, fully, I 
book out pretty quickly um, and you can be part of our kind of things like consultations and the manifesto process. So please do think about becoming a member. If you'd like some further information, um, you can email me, my email's on there, or you can visit the SURF website at the Join SURF section. Um, just next is the SURF Awards. Um, they've been open for quite a while now, since the 4th of June. Um, they close actually at 5pm on Monday, so if you are considering an application, you've still got a few days, or if you hadn't known about them and want to put an application in or nominate, a project that you know kind of deserves an award and have maybe done some good work throughout the, the crisis period and adapted quite quickly or um, a community that's pulled themselves together to deliver food and things to help their community through the crisis then definitely put them up for the awards. There's five categories, community led regeneration, supporting youth employability, Scotland's most improved place, uh, housing and regeneration and creative regeneration. We also run a caption competition every year um, with a wee funny image. This year it is a chameleon um, who obviously adapts and changes colour to his surroundings and adapts pretty quickly, very much like your communities, especially at the moment. Um, so if you want to come up with a funny caption, you can send it to me via email or tweet us on our Twitter or Facebook pages and um, we will consider and the best one gets a place at the Surf Awards dinner later in the year. Good. So just lastly, um, everybody got sent an evaluation form, so if you could please fill that out and send it back to us via email, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks again to uh, SURF sponsors and to particularly to the presenters today, Heather, Shona uh, and Nick, and thank you for all your time in participating. Uh, even in these COVID times, and perhaps even more so in these COVID times, it's not difficult to stay in touch. Please do give us any comments, give us any ideas, give us any information you've got. That's really what SURF is built on. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing many of you, I hope, for our final session a week today uh, with Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell on where Scottish Government policy is going in support of better regeneration, more successful regeneration in Scotland. Thank you.